Hello students of globalization, welcome back and today we're going to be discussing three issues that are I think closely related and that is terrorism, the question of human rights and their universality and where that comes from and just war theory of when is it okay to resort to violence. Is it okay to resort to violence? Uh, it's uh, it's these are all complicated questions and very uh, heady, big issues that we're going to have to deal with today. So uh, let's get to it. So I want to begin by asking the question: What is terrorism? The events of 9/11 and subsequent. Uh, bombings and attacks uh, uh, everywhere of uh, acts of mass violence, uh, the storming of the United States Capitol building, are these acts of terrorism? Um, what is terrorism? So I think if we turn to the UN, they have a, a resolution that was put forward in 2005, and it defines terrorism as this, as it is any act intended to cause death or serious bodily harm to civilians or non-combatants with the purpose of intimidating a population or compelling a government or an international organization to do or abstain from doing any act. So terrorism in this sense, as defined by our United States or our, our uh, United Nations, is the compulsion from a external body uh, to get a government or some some institution to do something that they want or stop doing something that they want. Uh, and how they do this is to cause extreme violence within a society uh, or to, to, to perpetrate acts of, of extreme violence within a society upon non-soldiers. Now, Within the United States proper, um, the U.S. Patriot Act in 2001, which gave expansive powers for the seeking and searching out of terrorists within uh, domestic, uh, it basically suspended civil rights uh, in some cases. Uh, it uh, allows expansive powers for uh, the FBI in order to, to seek out, find terrorist cells, and to stop them. And for good or bad, uh, the this uh, this act is still in place, um, and uh, and what what this act act did was to expand the definition of terrorism uh, to domestic groups, and the the uh, the specific definition here is that anything or any group that is dangerous to human life. Um, and this can really be expanded quite broadly. Now, as I think the uh, the seeking out uh, finding of terrorists is is a good thing, but um, at what point do we value our our civil rights more than the the uh, the crusade against terrorism? I think this is a very important question and one that we need to be asking ourselves: of well, when when do our rights uh, when can they be suspended? When should they be suspended? Should they be suspended at all? So what encourages someone to be a terrorist? Well, it comes from an ideological persuasion that someone believes that they or their culture or their tradition is something. They believe very strongly in their way of life, in their freedoms, and their rights, and, and uh, their, their religion, or whatever it might be. Um, but they believe that that is being taken from them, that they have a sense of violation, and uh, that injustice is being done. And they have, therefore, uh, when this injustice is being done, um, that they, they consider this an attack upon everything that they stand for, their culture, their religion their society and, and their ethos, just simply everything, how they behave and how they do. It's an attack on their way of life. And they have no other resort than to turn to violence 
and to try to attack this power that is uh, against them, or at least that's what they believe, that they cannot, they, they have exhausted um, all, all normal channels uh, in order to, to uh, stop whatever evil that they believe is, is uh, being perpetrated upon their society. And as these terrorists, uh, whenever a, a person is motivated, they t tend to try to convince other people of the same thing. So they attempt to indoctrinate other people. And groups, as they become larger and they become well-funded, um, they have the ability to shift from simply indoctrination to education. That they can then uh, adopt a system of education uh, that it, that uh, promotes their cause and, and suggests that they are right and that the the, whatever their enemy is, is uh, the, the problem, and that uh, whatever means necessary to defeat this enemy um, is, is necessary. Uh, for instance, we see uh, within the, uh, the Saudi Arabia, there previously, I think they've made some efforts to, to kind of reform their, their education effort, but within their Wahhabi uh, form of, uh, of, of Sunni Islam, um, it's, uh, it's really extreme... Uh, an, an extreme form of of uh, of Islam, and therefore, it's it, their education system is designed to teach that form of Islam, which is extremely hostile and xenophobic towards uh, anyone else that is not really part of that sect of, of Islam. So, in this way, they sort of disseminate uh, fear, and, uh, hate, and and and, uh, and they attempt to inspire a, a love of their their own core set of belief uh, of values, and this is. This is not within sort of a global vision, but it's very insular uh, in that uh, they want to promote their state, uh, their, their group. And I'm not suggesting Saudi Arabia is a terrorist, um, but just simply that the, this is how things work at a very large scale, and they have the ability to do this. Um, <clears throat> now, Osama bin Laden comes from a, a Saudi family, a, a prominent Saudi family, or he came from, um, and, uh, and many groups are funded through through these kinds of, of, uh, of activities, and we'll talk about this here. Um, so how, how do terrorist groups work? How do they function? Well, they first of all have to have the motivation that I just spoke about, that there has to be a sense, a great sense of injustice and, and uh, a, a means of uh, going, going about their activities uh, in, in, uh, in a way that they can they can inspire others. And they have to be well funded, of course. If you actually want to to succeed in your mission of attacking the enemy in their homeland, for instance, a 9/11 attack, uh, which is is uh, committing these uh, atrocities, is is in many cases the goal of, of a terrorist group. Almost always the goal of a terrorist group, or whatever it might be. Um, you have to have weapons, you have to have infrastructure, you have to have training. Um, so this requires funding, and you have to get that funding from somewhere. So you have to source your funds. You have to find people who think like you, who are rich, uh, nations that are rich, or at least have access to large amounts of, of, uh, of funds, and you have to convince them somehow to get them, or give them to you. Then you have to be able to shelter these funds. Uh, for instance, you would set up a, a uh, charity group or something like that that's just a shell uh, in name only, uh, and these funds are passed into the shell. And uh, then the funds are moved in uh, through multiple nations, usually uh, through, through highly uh, technical electronic frameworks uh, by people who are far more skilled at, at uh, moving money than, than just the average bear. Um, and then you have to be able to use the funds. You have to be able to acquire uh, your weapons of mass destruction. You have to be able to acquire uh, whatever whatever means of of uh, of war that you are going to to need in order to advance your terrorist group and uh, your ideology, and of course take the war to the enemy. And through this whole thing, you have to avoid authority. So it has to be very well done. It has to be secretive. It has to have a core group of very trustworthy people and people with a lot of really high and technical expertise uh, in order to to be able to to dodge all the national and international authorities and be able to source your terrorist organization. So this is highly complex, very, very uh, tough to do uh, and do well. 
but it, it has succeeded, of course. So we need to discuss human rights. Because within terrorism, um, within uh, sort of this globalized world that we have, what is, uh, what is a right or what is a, a human right specifically? And uh, a right is something that you believe that you are endowed with, uh, that, uh, that a certain authority has given you the, this liberty or this, this guarantee that cannot be violated, whether that be a constitution, whether that be a deity, whether that be great power or force, whatever it might be. Um, but a right is something that you have a guarantee to within a particular society, culture, or world in this sense. And a human right is something that is simply universal. Everyone, if, if we believe that there are human rights, it is something that all people have irrelevant of any situation. Now, I submit to you uh, that in order to believe that there are human rights, because there's no sort of world constitution or collective cultural mm -hmm. state that we um, that can guarantee these things, such as the United States government or constitution or something like that, but it, it uh, shared within uh, these, these belief in, in uh, human rights um, that certain values are, are inalienable, that everyone has them, they are recognized by the whole world, by all of humanity, that you have to have a strong belief in natural law. And we will get into natural law in just a moment, but human rights are something that is universal, everybody has them, and, uh, and it's, it's kind of debated what these are. The UN has, has put forward a, a great uh, statement on a resolution on, on human rights. Um, but but uh, they are different and, and, uh, and in origin and, and, uh, and goal and meaning and universality than certain civil rights, which simply just uh, civil rights are granted through being a citizen of a, of a particular state, whereas a human right is something that's, that is total. So again, I submit to you, you have to have a belief in natural law in order to believe um, in human rights as a universal, inalienable um, thing. And what is natural law? Well, it comes out of Western philosophy. And it is a belief in sort of eternal principles of, of truth and justice that are extended to everyone. Um, and you either need to believe in, that there is sort of a almost a, a supernatural power or that, the, that these laws are somehow innate within human beings, within their psychology, uh, from nature. And they are, they are universal in all time and all place. These are natural laws, meaning that they come straight out of nature, um, whether that be from a creator or whether that come from, uh, as I say, some sort of innate psychology that sort of gives us a sense of justice and truth. So I, I would uh, I would say if if uh, if I took a uh, if I stood in front of any group of human beings, uh, whether that be Al Qaeda, whether that would be um, the the U.S. Teachers Association, whether that would be the United States Congress or uh, the College of Cardinals, whatever it would whatever group that I would stand in front of, if I took a one year old child and I grabbed it by the leg, and I raised it up over my head and spiked its head onto the concrete. There would be a belief that I had not only perpetrated uh, or, or, a murder, but I had, I had violated a deep human right. Every person there would have a sense that I have committed a deep and horrible injustice against this little human being. And indeed, they would be right. Um, why is that? That every every one of these groups that would be radically different in their thinking um, would would have this sense of, of injustice. Well, it is because that I, I submit to you that we believe that there is a natural law that all human beings sort of recognize certain things um, that are not okay. 
um, and that it is evil based if we do certain things. So uh, human rights is deeply bound up within this sense of natural law. And um, since World War II, there has been an extreme effort uh, from our global, uh, uh, global world to, to guarantee that certain human rights uh, are, are protected and that we have enshrined them within our international institutions. Now, it has been successful in defining these things, but when they have the authority, the UN has the authority to, uh, to publish charters of human rights, but they don't always have the power to enforce them, and, and in cases such as Rwanda, where there was a genocide of over a million people in the mid-1990s, um, that they chose not to act to protect these human rights human rights. So uh, while the human right may exist in a universal sense, uh, without the power or the determination, the will to, to guarantee these rights w from international institutions and, and, uh, and nation states that support them, uh, you cannot, you can have them, but they are, are not uh, as potent uh, or powerful as, of statements as, as they could be as if, if they were enforced. So as I was saying, uh, here the, uh, the UN has put forward this, this statement that uh, we the peoples of the United, Sta uh, United Nations express our determination to reaffirm faith in fundamental rights and the dignity and worth of human beings in equal rights of men and women and of nations large and small. So the UN um, has been part of, of this effort of, of human rights and, and the rights of nation states and the rights of people in order that we all sort of have this sort of universal universal right to dignity um, and, uh, and, e and expression. Now, these, these rights, um, again, are, are only corresponding um, to the ability of the institution um, that has the power to enforce them. So these human rights not only have just simply been to sort of the life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, these sorts of things, um, but also they have tried to extend these rights uh, sort of to to other elements uh, of, of uh, humanity, meaning the, that we would try to sort of have education for everyone, that we would, that everyone sort of has a right to justice and food and, and free speech and these sorts of things. Which is, is again, un, unenforceable in, unless you decide to do such things. And, and again, this is more, uh, you can look at this slide here and see that the, the attempt of, of the world organizations post-World War II has been to sort of try to guarantee that all human beings have, have, um, have a, a basic, basic level of of, uh, of subsistence that that everyone in the world is a human being they have human rights uh, and uh, and therefore they all deserve to have a certain standard of living um, to where you have enough to eat someplace to live and and are sheltered has this been successful well we currently have millions and million tens of millions of people living in refugee camps um, we have not been successful in implementing this vision, but we do have a vision, and, and uh, it's worth considering, and uh, it's worth, uh, worth putting forward that we have, we have a vision, but we have to figure out ways in order to sort of guarantee these things if we want to really truly be good global citizens of the world. So this is – these uh, – these are some of the nations here that sort of have signed this this other uh, economic and social and cultural um, resolution here that uh, that would sort of guarantee this this baseline um, thing, you know, for hum for humanity. Um, which you can see, not all the great powers here: China, the United States, Great Britain, uh, Germany, Brazil, Australia, India. Uh, these uh, these nations have not uh, uh, have uh, signed on to this part of the agreement, so there's division among among the world powers. So you can see here I have several charts that have shown um, nations that have been 
uh, highly committed to to uh, the protection of human rights and those that have been less so. And then here you can see the uh, with the the darker red colors the, where more human rights violations have occurred, um, and the lighter the color, um, the less. So there's still lots of of reports from the UN of uh, massive and egregious violations of human rights. The question is, what will we do about that? So, human rights have been violated by nation states, as we saw here in this chart. Now the question is, when nation states violate human rights, as defined by the United Nations, when does the United Nations have the right or the ability to punish these nation states for attacking these universal rights that everyone has. Um, when does the UN have the right to intervene in sovereign nations affairs regarding poverty or economic uh, struggles? Uh, when when do, does the international community have a, is a, has a necessity in order to intervene? Um, well, that's really a good question. And when it's a smaller nation that doesn't fund these, these massive institutions, um, the, the answer seems to be, well, whenever the United Nations and the great powers that make up and pay for the United Nations, uh, such as the United States and China and France and, and uh, Great Britain, Germany, um, when these nation states sort of collectively within the United States, within the UN, and the, uh, the UN sort of decides it wants to intervene, it can basically do so as, as, it, as it wishes to do so. Now, if the UN were attempt to intervene in China or in the United States, uh, I suggest that it would be much, much more difficult. And they would probably, in all likelihood, not intervene. Um, when the United States uh, chose to ignore and flout international law without the uh, UN resolution to go into Iraq uh, w within the uh, Iraqi war, the second Iraqi war, um, nothing was done. Nothing really could be done because, well, the United States pays the bills for the organization, and without the United States, there would be no organization. So it, it, these are, are, are uh, um, very difficult questions in order to, to answer, and it's, it's difficult to say how this should be addressed um, because the United States has gone against many of the, um, of the resolutions of the UN um, and the, the famous Abu Ghraib, or Abu Ghraib uh, prison torture where, where uh, people, where Iraqis were being tortured by United States uh, military members. Uh, that was a human rights violation, a violation of the Geneva Convention of War, breaks international law, uh, but nothing was done to the United States other than a lot of finger wagging, at least from an international level. So different nation states with different powers are treated differently, I will say, from the UN. And it seems that if you are a big, powerful nation that pays for everything, uh, that you can largely get away with, uh, with certain violations and you can go largely unpunished, sadly. So, let us move forward uh, here in, in um, we have considered these questions, really, um, but I wanted to 
get to this question of genocide. That when we are considering human rights and terrorism, uh, we can think of sort of nothing more important than when, or nothing more uh, egregious than the violation of, of, uh, of, of human rights than genocide. So, as we look at, at, at these sorts of, of, of events within human history, that there has been genocide committed among uh, people for as long as people have existed, that sort of one group is seen as an enemy, and in order to cleanse a particular people or purify a nation-state, that these undesirable people... Um, are treated as subhuman and therefore deemed it is necessary to exterminate these people. Uh, we've seen this through a eugenics movement um, in the United States. We have seen this in World War II um, in, in, uh, with the mass extermination of Jews through the Holocaust. We have seen this in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, between the Hutus and, and Tutsis, we've seen this in Rwanda. Uh, we have it is uh, it's just horrible um, that we, uh, as human beings, we see another group as so undesirable and so subhuman that um, that we can we can deem them unworthy of life and exterminate them in mass. So what what leads us to this? And you can see here um, the many genocides that have happened quite recently um and these have happened it's not confined to one culture or one people but this is something that has happened all over the world and here you can see sort of the the uh massive amount of of people that are killed through genocides And when you, you look at genocides, it's not always simply just a group of people deciding something, but often it's a government, such as in North Korea, that decides that, uh, uh, that you are against it. So that is really a politicide, uh, that uh, when you were in violation of, of, this, of a certain, certain um, loyalty to the party or the government, uh, that uh, you and your people can simply just be wiped out entirely such as the Kurds in, in northern Iraq with Saddam, uh, Saddam Hussein in the first Gulf War. Here again you can see the number of genocides and politicides. Bosnia is again another famous area where uh, there was... was uh, a minority of people, the minority culture was um, wiped out by the dominant culture. And we need to ask ourselves when we consider questions like this, um, why are these, these people together? Well, it's because this sort of artificial nation-state model um, was, was placed upon a large group of people in the Balkans um, after the World Wars that you just simply draw lines on a map and say this great power is going to get this region so you create Yugoslavia and you throw together people who have never got along that don't share any culture society religion uh, they don't uh, they are distinct groups of people and that they don't get along they've never got along and now you're going to throw them together ask them to be a democratic nation state and uh and we're going to, and then you're just going to get along and everything's going to work great. Well, it usually doesn't because then whoever is in the majority will end up uh, persecuting the minority, and uh, then that is how genocides uh, sometimes happen. So you can, you can see here um, that the the movement of the Bosnian genocide where um, at at least uh, eight thousand Serbians um, were were 
were murdered um, by the the uh, the dominant population. So, when genocides happen, when genocides happen, sometimes the world and other nation states decide to get involved. So we need whoops we need to consider what is just war and when are we justified as a nation state or as a international community um, to intervene in um, in other nations affairs and when is it right to go to war when is it is it okay to use violence against other human beings is it ever okay to use violence against other human beings and some pacifists uh, such as uh, Trotsky, Leo Trotsky, uh, have suggested no. It's never okay to use violence under any any uh, any conditions. That violence only perpetuates other violence, and you don't know the outcomes of your your interventions. Um, that if uh, am I justified if a man is going to kill a child? Am I justified to pull out my weapon and kill him? Well, Trotsky would say no, you're not. Um, because first of all, you don't know if he's actually going to kill that child. Um, and you don't know what the effects of your killing might be upon uh, other people. Is then someone going to come back and kill you and it will ignite a civil war? Um, so under no circumstance are you given the right. There is no just there's no just war uh, theory within uh, certain thinkers. Now, other people like Martin Luther King, Mahatma Gandhi, um, have said only passive resistance is fair. That that is the only way you should you should uh, engage your enemy is through passive resistance. That you simply uh, you do not actually take violence to your enemy, um, but rather you you passively resist your enemy through marches, through through sit downs, um, whatever it is. You just don't use violence against violence. That though you may be uh, acts of violence may be perpetrated against you, um, nevertheless, you never take that back to your enemy because violence only perpetrates more violence. So, the next theory is that in some cases, violence is necessary. That if an armed enemy is going to storm into your house and murder your family, that you have a right, maybe not a right, um, but it is, it is okay and justifiable that you would arm yourself and fight this enemy. So... When we take this to a larger scale, we have to think of this as sort of an ethical agreement. That war is always a very horrible and nasty thing. It's often glorified. Um, but when war happens, people get severely hurt. People die. Um, there are massive and egregious abuses of human rights within war. Um, and in cases... Some people believe that you have to go to war and that it is justified, justifiable to go to war. So uh, these, these cases are, are extraordinary and should be avoided uh, under uh, all, uh, all circumstances. So we, we need to ask ourselves, when and if is it right to go to war? When is it right to wage war, and what's the best way, if we have to go to war, to conduct this war? Now, if we were live and in person, this is a very good debate. Um, but I want you to think about these questions. Um, if the goal is to win a war, why do we conduct it in a moral way? Why is there certain things that we don't do? Well, it's because of human rights, natural law, and a belief um, that we are not uh, we are not fighting um, non-combatants. 
you know, the, the uh, janitor doing his job at a uh, government institution, though he is going to be blown up uh, in the missile strike that uh, destroys the, uh, the Ministry of War in the, the nation you are fighting against. He did absolutely nothing uh, it, to, to wage war against you. Is it just, therefore, that he die in a missile strike? Someone who's a non-combatant. Something to think about. So throughout history, um, there, there is a theory, a theory of, of just war. And many great thinkers um, have suggested that there are rights and ways um, that war can be done justly. That war, if you have to go to war, can be justified. And I'll just, I don't have time here to, to get into everyone, um, but I just want to talk about St. Augustine, the great Christian thinker and saint. And St. Augustine says, You are only justified to go to war if you are doing two things, and that is to return peace to the region that you are going to go fight, and that you believe that more good is going to come from your intervention than bad. You are never justified to go to war uh, for your own interests, but only if you believe it is for serving a higher good of returning peace uh, and tranquility to a region and that you will accomplish more good by what you're about to do than if you don't intervene. So, if you said, I need to intervene in the Rwandan genocide, because I believe a million people are going to be murdered for no other reason than their ethnicity or their culture. So if I go in and murder 2,000 of the opposition and some innocent people are going to die, is it better that I go in and murder 2,000 people and intervene? than for one million to die, to, for me to allow that to happen. Uh, Augustine would say, you are justified in this action, that you will, will not suffer repercussions um, uh, from, from God in his, his sense, because, of course, he's a Christian thinker, um, because of this, and that you are justified in order to go to war um, through that. And most just war theory um, comes from out of Augustine. It, it uh, emanates from Augustine within the, the West, and that is really what we are talking about here. So, just war theory, it's not a doctrine. It's not something that we can say, okay, we will define it, and it, this is exactly what it means, um, but simply it's, it's a, an area of, of philosophical consideration to where we have to understand and really think about what we are doing. Is this ethical? Um, how, can we, um, how, can we make, um, how can we make war to where it is restrained, to where the least amount of human rights violations occur that is possible? Uh, and then how do we, from this use of violence, um, create a, a lasting, just peace uh, that will, will allow us not to have to go back to war again? Do you rebuild the society? How do you rebuild the society? Um, how are the people, the conquered, treated after the war? Uh, uh, these are all considerations that we have to, to understand how do you, uh, what we do. In World War II, the decision was made to use the atomic bomb against Japan. And at the time, Harry Truman, or afterwards as he reflected upon it, he believed that he made the most ethical decision that he could have made because if he had allowed a traditional and conventional bombing uh, scheme to continue in Japan, uh, that more Japanese lives would be lost, vastly more Japanese lives would be lost through a conventional campaign than by the use of the atomic bomb.
because the atomic bomb would would convince them to surrender, and moreover that he was protecting um, um, many more American lives as well. So he believed it was the most ethical decision that he could have made to use the atomic bomb against Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Um, I'm not sure how we can argue that uh, using a nuclear weapon against humanity is in any way ethical, but this is uh, this is something that we have to think about when you were talking about war and, and the atrocities and the horror that comes from war, um, is that uh, your goal is to make it uh, to to restrain uh, yourself as much as possible uh, and and, uh, and to make the war as as non-directed at non-combatants as possible and it must be the absolute last resort and uh, and we have have uh, just gone over this that we have to understand the just cause I gave the example of Rwanda this was a massive violation the genocide the Rwandan genocide against human rights um, so, what what gives a nation state or international community the the just cause to intervene? I would say the extermination of a million people and a gross violation of human rights would indeed be just cause if we can have any just cause. To intervene yet we did not intervene um, and we attempted or we we cited all these things there was a massive and gross violation of human rights um, that that uh, we needed to punish those who had done this it was not acceptable um, and it, it needed to be we we had to reassert a sort of global universal sense of human rights and defend uh, others against this this attack and and uh, and uh, and break of human rights violations. So I really got ahead of myself there, um, but I I gave the example of Japan and the use of atomic weapons that just war is something that usually you don't kill citizens hundreds of thousands of citizens died in the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki um, just war is something that is directed at non-combatants um, and this has been really enshrined within the Geneva Convention of War uh, which is a is sort of rule the the rules of conduct that uh, you can never use biological warfare you cannot use uh, poison gas in warfare as uh, Saddam Hussein did against the Kurds and, and his own people uh, uh, in the late 80s <clears throat> early 90s in Iraq that we of course cannot use weapons of mass destruction meaning nuclear weapons though we have them and the United States is the only one that has ever used these weapons in anger. Um, but it is, it is an attempt. The Geneva Convention of War sort of prohibits certain things and, and sets rules on how captured enemies can be treated. Um, and, uh, and, 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 it, and it tries to conduct war in as humane a way as possible, if that makes any sense. So... When wars end, there is always an attempt to put things back together because the ultimate goal of a just war is, of course, to return peace and, and prosperity to a land. And therefore, uh, when a war is over and an enemy is conquered, those who have violated human rights um, – have to be punished for their crimes. One of the most famous uh, punishments of this was the Nuremberg uh, trials. Um, but they have to sort of stand trial. But where do they stand trial? Is sort of an international court, and we have this at the Hague. Uh, um, but these mechanisms are still being worked out, and and how they are 
to be enforced? You know, are you tried under what laws are you tried under? Um, how is how is a UN law or a resolution a binding set of international laws? How are you held accountable um, to this? Who is to hold you accountable? Where would you serve your prison sentence? Um, these are these are all questions of of uh, what what has to happen. So, I have talked ad nauseum about uh, uh, Rwanda here, but I think we have have covered uh, many of the controversies um, that have happened and how the U.S., uh, how the uh, uh, U.N., and how the world community has attempted to to intervene uh, from time to time when, or not intervene from time to time, uh, when when gross violations of human rights are conducted. So this is, we are justifying going to war um, because uh, of the violation of human rights, and we believe that we are going to do more good than bad by intervening into whatever situation um, that we are, are uh, intervening in. So I'll just, for one briefly here, um, the Iraq War was a decision to intervene by a U.S. president um, who did not get the, uh, the support of an international coalition. And eventually, the Iraqi government was toppled, it was overthrown, um, and the question is, was this a justified action? And what were the motivations for this? There was not a lot of evidence um, of the gross human rights violations that uh, Saddam Hussein had perpetrated against his people, um, as he had in the past. Um, so the U.S. largely went against the international community and intervened anyway. So what do we believe is, is uh, the point of human rights? What is the, the point of having an international coalition that defines human rights? If big nation states can do as they please and suffer very little, if no consequences, uh, from their actions, um, is this a just and good system? How do you create an international community without a coalition of of uh, of large and powerful nation states that are united in their causes? It's very difficult. And um, but I hope throughout this lecture um, that we have we have covered an expansive topic from human rights uh, to terrorism to just war theory and how this has been uh, has been understood at a macro level since World War II and how this has developed um, and how particular situations in the modern world have brought the global community together to ask the questions about human rights and when is it okay for a nation state or group of nation states to intervene um, and how does this all work and fit together uh, and, and the sort of messiness of, of, of defining human rights and, and, and protecting human rights uh, within the world. And I don't think that we have a perfect uh, solution. I don't think that we have a perfect, uh, a perfect uh, coalition in order to guarantee human rights. But the, the key is that we have to first have the vision to bring this global community together uh, in order that all people might live in it with a certain amount of dignity uh, and that, uh, that no one nation state should be, um, should be able to flout um, the, the decrees of, of this international body that has come together as we seek to make a good and harmonious globalized world. So I thank you for watching, and I thank you uh, for uh, taking the time to consider some of these very big and difficult questions. So until next time, stay healthy, wealthy, and wise.